Please be seated. All right. Good morning. I've learned to take a moment and just like tap it to see if it will whine if I get close to the other microphone. It's good to see everyone here. It's good to be here. We just sang uh, that song and it used the word panoply. Do you guys know what a panoply, what that word means? You're looking it up right now. <laughs> it's the, it's the uh, Greek word for the whole armor. So it's from Ephesians chapter 6, the whole armor of God. It's from that passage. I, uh, you know, I like that song because it uses a word that, oh, I know what that means. <laughs> I understand that reference. In Romans chapter 10, the passage that was read for us, let's see if this works. It does. Oh, it buzzed. Interesting. In Romans chapter 10, the passage that was read for us, it's talking about, in that time, a, a, a great big mission field that still remained uh, for the Apostle Paul and the other servants of God to reach out to, and that was the, uh, the Israelites, the, the people of uh, the Hebrew family, the Jews, who had thus far, by and large, rejected Jesus, refused to obey the gospel, and Paul was saying that uh, they still need the gospel. This people that had uh, chosen to reject the, the Savior that they had been waiting for for centuries, he says they still need the gospel. Even if they've chosen to reject it, they still need people to go out and preach the, the, the good news to them. And <clears throat> talking about them rejecting Christ, he mentions something very important. That is, there were still places where they had not uh, had, had a servant of Christ come and bring the gospel to them. Now, that doesn't mean that they haven't heard the gospel. As he makes clear, um, which verse did he make that clear? <laughs> verse, verse 16, yes. They had, they, it's not that they haven't heard the gospel, but more that they haven't heard it from a Christian. That they haven't heard it from a servant of Christ. And instead, they've just heard it from the scriptures. And so he says, well, how, how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Of course, they need to believe, but how will they believe in him if they've not heard of him? And how will they hear of him if no one goes to tell them about him? And so it brings up, uh, this passage brings up an important truth, and like Terry said, Mission Sunday is next week, so we're talking about missions today. It brings up an important truth about every mission done uh, for the sake of the gospel, and that is there are two types of people involved in every mission. Um, not referencing the person hearing the gospel, I guess you could say. And these two types of people are, uh, one, the person who goes and preaches the gospel. How will they believe in whom they have not heard, and how will they hear about him if no one ever goes and talks to them about it? I think that's intuitive, right? There's the, uh, there's the old thought uh, exercise of if you took a Bible in the language of some hitherto uncontacted um, tribe in like the Amazon or something, and you just dropped it from a plane into their town. And they read it. Will that produce Christians? Will, will that lead them to Christ? Uh, and it's a good thought experiment, good way of illustrating like the Word of God is the seed that brings forth the church. However, that kind of thing doesn't happen. Like that, that's a nice thought experiment, but that doesn't happen. We don't fly planes over isolated tribes in the Amazon and drop Bibles in whatever their language is. 
Instead, the thing that does happen is that followers of Christ go and talk to them about it. They go and they make contact with people and they preach the truth and whatever outcome that brings, the, the, the one who preaches understands that that's not really their responsibility. Their responsibility is to preach the truth, to preach the word to these people who have not heard of it. How shall they hear without a preacher, a proclaimer? And it says, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Do you have pretty feet? That's a weird question, but, you know, do you have those beautiful feet? How beautiful are the feet who preach the gospel of peace. The feet that extend the gospel to those far off places. And I guess you could also say who extend the gospel to one's neighbors and one's family. But of course we're talking about missions this morning, so that's what we're going to focus on. But what about the other type of people that are involved in these missions? Anybody have a guess of who they are? Let's read on. Verse uh, 16, But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So, Oh no, I skipped a verse. This is where it comes in. Verse 15, sorry. If you've got your Bible in front of you, it's easier to follow along than my ramblings, right? How shall they preach unless they are what? Sent. How shall they preach unless they are sent? The one type of person that is involved in missions is the person who goes. The other type of person who the Bible is going to point out for us is equally as important. Who is not irrelevant is the one who sends. The people who send. How shall they preach unless they are sent? Ultimately, it is God who does all the sending, right? Yet, God works in ways that are not always miraculous, right? And missionaries need to eat and missionaries need clothes on their back. And missionaries need a way to get to the place that they're going. Where does all that come from? It comes from the people who send. Terry asked me to speak about supporting missions instead of just speaking about the missions themselves. Uh, next week we're going to talk about the missions themselves. But supporting missions... A lot of times people have this idea that uh, I mean, if I'm not the one who is going to Peru, then I don't really have my hand in Peru. And it's not really something that is involving me. So like, why should I even care about supporting it? I'm so, I'm so uh, apart from what is going on over there. And it really stems from a misunderstanding of the fact that the one who sends is important. And it's a role that I look out on the audience and I see many people who are not able to go to Peru, right? Who are not able to jump on a plane or a boat, if you're very eccentric, and go to Peru. But yet, you still have a responsibility and you still have a part in that work. And you can fill Peru in with any place on the planet. But you still have a part in that work if you are going to be the one who sends. The one who supports. There are people who receive a commendation in the Scriptures because they 
supported God's servants. And I'll just lightning round through them. But uh, in 1 Kings 17, there is a woman in the town of Zarephath, and that's a that's a not Gentile, that's a not Israelite city, it's a Gentile city. And this is in the days of the prophet Elijah. He's on the run from uh, the Israelite monarch, and he and his queen want to murder Elijah. And God sends him to this city and tells him, I commanded a widow in this town to help you, to take care of you, to make sure that you don't starve. When he comes to the city, he finds this widow and this, he asks the widow, hey, do you have any food? And if you know the story, then you know how remarkable it is. She says, uh, I do. I have enough flour to like, make one meal and, and enough water to like, have one person drink it. And I was going to go in and make our last meal and then we're going to starve. Because, by the way, a drought was going on, so there was no food. And Elijah says, Make me some food first. Make me some food first. This is the last bit of food this woman has. Uh, And yet, she decides, this is a man of God, and I will show my hospitality and give my support for him. She makes him uh, like a cake, uh, not like a sugary cake, but (laughs) like a loaf. And what do you know? The flour is not running out. She's got this little bit of flour in a jar and she scoops some out and there's more in there. She's got a little bit of oil and she pours it out to make the cake and there's still more in the, in the jar. It's a miracle. And the Bible mentions that the flour and the oil did not run out for the entire span of the drought, which would go on for three more years. This woman and her son, their lives were saved because she obeyed God and took care of his his servant. And of course, later in that story, the widow's son uh, dies. And she's distraught. She says, "I uh, I took care of you and And my son has died now. And what does God do for the son? Raises him back to life. He's resurrected from the dead for this woman who showed support for God's servant. I know I said I would breeze through these, but I'm... (laughs) You know me. Then, for Elijah's successor, Elisha, there is the woman from Shunem who... uh, the, the, the verses say she noticed that Elisha would come through their town a lot, and she said to her husband, let's just sort of attach or a set aside like a spare room so that whenever he comes through our town, he can just have a place to stay. And they do so, and they let Elisha know. He starts staying at their place whenever he's passing through, and much like, um, much like the widow in Zarephath, her son also dies and is also raised uh, through Elisha. Then also there's the, uh, the kings of Persia. Did you know that uh, the king of Persia, Cyrus, is referred to as God's servant? And his chosen shepherd, uh, Isaiah 44, I believe. I had checked it right before I got up here, but I didn't put a bookmark in it. So <laughs> He's referred to by the Lord as his servant and his shepherd. Because he would play the pivotal role of uh, once Babylon fell and it went to Cyrus the Great, he would say, The Jews may go home, and they may rebuild the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem. And he's referred to as a faithful servant of the Lord. 
because of that. He's called God's instrument. And then you have in the books of uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, the other kings of Persia, who when uh, there was conflict in the, uh, in, in the province with people who didn't want to see Jerusalem rebuilt, Ezra and Nehemiah wrote letters to these kings and said, Cyrus gave us the go-ahead to do this, and we need you to step in with your ultimate authority and tell these people that they need to let us do this. And so not only did the kings tell those, uh, those um, the opposition that they needed to allow the Jews to rebuild Jerusalem, he said, uh, now you guys have to help them. You have to give them whatever they ask for so that they can rebuild the city because the throne told them so. These kings are referred to as servants of God and they are, they are shown to have done this great thing in supporting God's people. You also have the, uh, the women who accompanied Jesus. In Luke 8, verse 3, it says that they supported Jesus and the disciples out of their own means. Uh, everyone in the list that does so is a woman. And I'm, I'm not exactly certain on how much money a woman was able to make in the first century, uh, but it certainly was not like oodles of money, right? And yet, they chose to support Jesus and support his disciples. Jesus mentions elsewhere that, you know, birds have their nests, foxes have their dens, but the Son of Man has nowhere to rest his head. Of course, he stayed in people's houses and stuff, in the upper room, like on the day before he was crucified. He's saying, I don't have a permanent place because I don't have property. Jesus and the disciples stayed in rooms and they ate and they drank off of other people's generosity. And these women are commended in the gospel for being the people who supported them. They're immortalized for it. And of course, we also have the churches in, in Macedonia. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 7. Paul, this is the one I'm actually going to turn to. <laughs> Paul mentions... <clears throat> Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their generosity. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, even beyond their ability, they were freely willing imploring us with urgency that we should receive the gift and the fellowship and the ministering to the saints. Not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then they gave to us by the will of God. So, we uh, urged Titus that as he, had been, as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. But as you abound in everything, church in Corinth, as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. This grace, not referring to the saving grace of God, this grace is referring to the type of graciousness that the churches in Macedonia showed, when even if they were poor, even if they, uh, in, all, in all logic, they would say, I really can't <laughs> right now. Money's tight. They still showed that generosity. Uh, I don't know if you remember what dire state the, the church was in in the first century. There was a, a famine that happened in basically all of the Middle East, especially in Judea. And so 
the churches in Macedonia, which is around Greece, and also the churches in Greece, they found themselves in the position of being the ones who were better off. You know, they, were, they had more because these churches in Judea were going to be hit by this famine. They, like, people would start dying. And so, they donated. Even though, by all means, many of them were poor, they still gave. Because people's lives depended on it. If they can give for people's physical needs because their physical lives depended on it, how much more willing should a Christian be to give their support to supply people's spiritual needs because their souls depend on it? That is a hard saying. That is a hard saying. Few there are who can bear it. Um, because there's, there's sort of a, a plague of apathy that happens nowadays. Like if, if someone doesn't literally themselves go across the seas to do this work, they feel like they're not doing this work. And they feel like, they, they feel like it's not uh, needed. But as we talked about the churches in Macedonia, let's move on to a specific church in Macedonia to which a, a book of the Bible was written. We're going to talk about the church in Philippi. So, I don't know why that's indented, but uh, turn to Philippians chapter 4. If you've got a Bible in your lap or in your pocket or in front of you on the pew, turn to Philippians chapter 4. And I want to make two important points from the text here. I'll wait for the, the rustling of pages to cease. Then I'll know that we're all there. Okay. <laughs> so Philippians chapter 4, 10 through 13. Paul says to the church in Philippi, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished once again. Though you surely did care, but you were lacking the opportunity. Now that I speak in regard to, uh, to need, or sorry, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, meaning lacking, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned to be full and also to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What's Paul saying here? I want us to understand that God's servant rejoices when others, other servants of Christ, go ahead and lend them their support. They rejoice. They're so happy. When Christians decide to support a missionary, that missionary just loves it so much. They are so grateful. They give praise to the Lord. But also, understand that God's servant will still serve even if you don't support them. Hmm. Paul served with all joy when the church in Philippi was sending him support. He ate and he drank his food in thankfulness to God, and he preached the word. And Paul still served, even when the church in Philippi was not sending their support. That's not to speak badly on them. He says they lacked the opportunity. Something got in the way. But the point is that he was lacking the support. 
and he still served the Lord. And while he was sitting awake at night with his stomach giving him pains because he was hungry and his back shivering from the cold because he couldn't clothe himself properly, he still preached the word with all joy and with all uh, gra gratefulness to God. A missionary who has understood that they are called to go across the seas and preach the word to a hitherto uncontacted community, they will do it by whatever means they have, even if you choose to not lend your support. They'll do it. Um, even if all their support gets cut off, it's what they'll do. And they will be hungry, and they will be cold, and they will be lonely. But if you do support them, they'll still do it. But they will be full, and they will be warm, and they will perceive fellowship. Does that pull on your heartstrings? It should. Right? The, 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 the point of this short passage here is your, one, our, our support is both needed and unnecessary. When, when Paul says that one is not to give uh, grudgingly or of necessity, of necessity means that you believe it depends on you. that the, the church in Corinth believed that if they didn't give, that um, the church in Judea really would die out. Did they believe that? Paul says, don't believe that. The church will live on. Um, the only question is whether or not you're going to help. <laughs> uh, the church in Philippi, he wanted them to understand his mission will still go on even if they didn't give. And so, what, what that should do for your mind is to say, it's a, it's a free will thing. It's a free will thing. It's not required of me. But if I do it, it's because I wanted to do it. And I know that such a thing is what makes God truly happy. When someone of their own free will decides to love Him and to obey Him of their own free will. It becomes a free will thing. Here's an illustration. <laughs> Esther, chapter 4. Mordecai told them to answer Esther, Do not think in your heart, that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews, for if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from some other place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Deliverance for the Jews... The, the saving of all their lives did not depend on Esther. Sometimes you read the book of Esther and you think, Esther saved the Jews. Esther didn't save the Jews. God saved the Jews. And it was through Esther. But if Esther decided that she was too scared, it would have happened some other way, is what Mordecai is saying. It would have happened some other way. If we choose, if we decided next week that we would not give a single cent to supporting missionaries, those missions would still happen. And we would be the ones who suffer loss because we chose not to support them. Um, Esther, the deliverance for the Jews uh, did not depend on Esther's decision. But guess what? Guess what did depend on Esther's decision? Uh, Esther's deliverance did. 
Mordecai says, if you choose not to, I need you to understand. You're like, you're in the palace, and Haman is in the palace. Haman, the man who's trying to kill all the Jews, he's in there too, and it's going to come out that you're a Jew, and he's right there. Like, you're not going to be saved. Deliverance for the, for the people did not depend on Esther's decision, but deliverance for Esther sure did. Is that convicting to you? The mission, the mission is not going to depend on you. The, the saving of these people off in foreign lands is not going to depend on you, but there is something that is affected by your decision of like how generous you're willing to be here. And then the second part that I put up here, verses 14 through 18. Nevertheless, you've done well that you shared in my distress. What was that word? Shared. In my distress? Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but only you. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities, and now that I seek the gift, but, or not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Jay, you're an accountant. You're a CPA. I don't know what your account looks like, but I'm sure that the people that you work with, they have accounts that abound. <laughs> um, if someone owns or contributes, someone uh, contributes support sounds more, um, more like nonprofit, but if someone owns shares and the company gains money, do they get a share? And it abounds to what? Some other account? It abounds to their account. It is because they have supplied the capital, capital being like not DC, but they have supplied the, the, the ability to do the work, the, um, the product of the work is credited to them. I don't know if this is a foreign concept to you or not, but also I, I skipped verse 18. I'm sorry. Indeed, I have all and abound, and I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. It is well-pleasing to God when Christians support those who are going out and performing this service to the Lord. Support enables the work, right? It's not that the work depends on your support, but it enables it to uh, be done in like a, a better way, right? Support enables the work. Like how the person who owns shares in the company is the person who is also supplying the company in some way whether it's their decision-making or if it's actually supplying capital. Support enables the work. Paul says, verse 17, it is considered equal to doing the work. He says, I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Paul, supported by the church in Philippi, he says like from the beginning of his, his journey here, supported by the church in Philippi, goes to some town, and he converts X number of Christians. Not that like we're actually kind of keep count, but he supports X number of Christians. God consider, considers it that the church in Philippi had a hand in the preaching of the word and the converting of X number of Christians. 
I mean, that's why every now and again we have missionaries whom we support come here and tell us about the things that they're doing. Because it's not just them doing those things. Because we lend our support, we are doing that too. And that's why we have a, a, an interest in kind of, you know, making sure that what they're doing is the good thing to be doing. But we also are interested in hearing about what the result is. Because it's considered as us doing it too. And so that's what I want us to understand about uh, not just missions, but about supporting missions. Because next week we're going to have the, the special collection for like all of what get, is given in that collection is going to support missionaries. It's going to support mission work. When you give to those efforts, the putting the money in the plate is not the only thing you're doing. When you give to support those efforts, you are in equivalency performing those works. James says, faith without works is dead. Uh, so, you know, just next week, take the opportunity and go ahead and don't have a dead faith. <laughs> but it's, it's equivalent, it's counted by God as you doing it. Just as much as it is counted as the person who went out to Peru or went to, into the Caribbean or, or went to, I don't know all the places where we support missionaries who go out to them. Just as much as it is counted as them doing it. It's important. It's, it's a blessed thing. Beautiful are the feet that bear the, the good news. But if supporting that work, doing the sending, is counted as the equivalent of doing the work, then blessed are your feet. Feet? I, it's... The analogy is maybe not 100%, but blessed are your feet <laughs> for sending the one who is going to bear the good news. So when we come to next week, don't think it's not important. It's very important. Like I said, this, this, this uh, sermon was all about m mission work, and so this is sort of uh, disjointed from the rest of it, but we're going to extend the invitation. If you are not a Christian this morning, if you're not a part of God's kingdom, this kingdom that is, uh, that is grown every time a missionary goes out and preaches the gospel and convinces people. If you're not a part of this kingdom, you can become a part of it this morning. Like Paul said, faith comes by hearing. And not just hearing anything, but hearing the word of God. And also, Jesus says that you must believe in order to be saved. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son so that whoever would believe in him might not perish, but instead have life everlasting. You must repent. You must turn away from sin. We've all done sin, you must turn away from it. The apostles in Acts 3 are talking to uh, the, the, those Jewish leaders who had rejected Christ. Some of them are, uh, not some of them, it's close enough in time that it was all of them, had sentenced him to his death. And he says, you can repent. Have you done something as serious as send a man to his death? Probably not. But whatever you have done, you can repent. You can turn away from it and turn to God. And also, one must confess. Romans 10, 9 through 10, Paul says, you must confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord, that God raised him from the dead. 
And if you do, you will be saved. And also, Peter says in 1 Peter 3.21, baptism, which is not the washing of filth from your body, because it is kind of like a bath, but it's not a bath, is actually you making an appeal to God for a good conscience before Him. To have your sins washed away so that you can be before God without fear. If you have sin, if you are not a Christian, you've not done this, there's some fear that should be in your heart. But once you do this, Romans 8.1, there is no condemnation. You should not be afraid because your sins will have been washed away. And also, Revelation 2.10, this is the last bit. After you become a Christian, remain faithful as a Christian. Jesus says, Revelation 2.10, remain faithful even unto death, and I will grant you crown of life. And so, if you're not a Christian this morning, um, you, you can choose to become one. You can choose to become one right now and not wait a single moment longer as together we all stand and we sing. I am I no more. I am I, I no more. I've been born with blood. I am I, I no more. Oh, Jesus is my Lord. Oh, Jesus is, is my Lord. And, and he rules my life. Oh, Jesus is my Lord. But oh, he will come again. And he will come again, and then he'll take me home. He will come again, so I am I no more. I am I, I no more. And I've been born with blood. I am mine no more. Please be seated. Mike, okay. Aiden has come this morning wanting to uh, give his life to Christ, wanting to turn away from sin and to be washed clean of his sin. And so, um, Aiden, uh, confessing Christ is one of the things, like I said, one of the things that uh, is required, one of the things that we must do. Uh, in order to be saved, to show that we have that faith. So I want to ask you, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that God raised him from the dead? Yes. That's a beautiful thing. So based on that confession, we're going to baptize you. We're going to head up there, and um, you'll begin your new life in Christ.